Welcome to Careers in Discovery, your window into the world of leaders in pharma and biotech. Brought to you by Singular Talent, making hiring better for organizations involved in drug discovery and R&D. With BioRelate, Dan Jameson is on a mission to curate truths in drug discovery using AI. We talked to Dan about his journey with the company, the state of play in AI in drug discovery, and the novel scientific insights hiding in plain sight. This week on Careers in Discovery, I'm joined by Dan Jameson of BioRelate. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Good to, good to see you. Um, Dan, we always start by talking a little bit about the company, the work you're doing, um, and where you're at with it. Um, so tell us a bit more about BioRelate and curating truths with AI. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I, I guess I started the company um, something like seven and a half years ago in the middle mm-hmm. of PhD at the University of Manchester. Um, where it all started was off the back of a project I had working with Pfizer. They, at the time, were very interested in developing novel therapeutics for chronic pain diseases, mm. not things like um, neuropathic pain, which um, affect a, a lot of people, something like over 10% of people in Europe. And um, I built what we called the world's first pain interactome, which um, sounds really boring, but it was quite interesting in that we we essentially stitched together all of the different cause and effect relationships between different proteins, different chemicals, which mm. are documented in the context of pain research. So it's out there sitting in literature, sitting in publications, um, kind of in plain sight, but it wasn't structured, wasn't connected together, wasn't mapped out into this network like structure. Um, so we built this graph and then we used this graph to essentially come up with lots of different hypotheses as to what might be novel and promising therapeutics to treat chronic pain diseases. Mm -hmm. Um, And from those hypotheses, Pfizer then tested um, a load of them and came back eventually with a 42% hit rate, which was about double what they'd previously gotten from working within that research area. Wow. And it really, I guess, illuminated me to the, the fact that you've got all of this really valuable data that's out mm. there. As I say, most of it's in, in kind of plain sight, sat in text, but it's spread across millions of publications, patents, clinical trials, articles, and, and companies as big as Pfizer are not really properly using it. Yeah. So what, what I decided to do was to start a company which essentially focused on solving that problem, which the mission being to create knowledge to advance the world's most promising therapeutics. So, yeah, going back to that tagline you, you say there, curating truths of AI, mm. it's, very much, um, it's very much trying to understand the state of truthfulness within biomedical research for using more um, automated solutions, things like AI and machine learning, to, to try and capture all of this data. Yes. So we, we've very much been on that journey since that point, and we're now trying to solve this problem ubiquitously across biomedical research, um, yeah, using AI and, and, and great people to help build out the company and work with really interesting drug discovery companies that are um, trying to solve some very, very important problems um, within diseases. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of the story of BioRelate. That's, broadly speaking, the, the problem area that we're in. But, um, yeah, if you, if you want to dive into that anyway, yeah, please ask Yeah, me. no, absolutely. So, so I guess, essentially, then, it, it's, I suppose, this idea that, I mean, there's so much research happening around the world, right? There's thousands and thousands, millions of researchers doing great work. Um, if you can't find that work, you have to repeat it. You have to do it again. Someone's probably already out there, done it, gathered that data, generated that insight. That, I suppose shortcutting that process of having to uh, having to repeat experiments, repeat um, hypotheses, and um, and build on what's already there rather than yeah, absolutely. So it. Part of it is is exactly that. It's mm. uncovering what are the kind of unknown knowns to people. So as you, as you say, that there's evidence that's out there. It's sat in, in published research. Um, some people know about it. It's really quite valuable, obviously, to put together those those studies and, and publish all of that data is, is an incredibly arduous process that 
um, it's very costly in itself. Mm. So there's lots of this type of data that's out there and the context around it um, is very, very important. And, and the way that we've captured this data um, for the last few decades, um, and maybe even yeah, much longer than that probably, it is essentially to have human beings read through these documents and put this data into databases. Mm. And I'm talking about um, the, the kind of basic stuff that you would search for in maybe like a Google search or, or that kind of thing. I'm talking about the really difficult to curate data that typically you couldn't get at from search engines. Yeah. So a good example is something like cause and effect, where you're, you're trying to understand how a particular drug inhibits a, a particular drug target. Um, what what cell line that that particular experiment was was documented in, you know all of the different contexts around these different cause and effects events. Uh, it's really quite difficult to capture. So you've got all of these kind of unknown knowns that sit out there that are really quite interesting and valuable. Mm. It's it even more interesting when you when you stitch them together into this this network like structure. Um, so then you get into the world of of kind of unknown unknowns where nobody has linked together this particular drug target with this particular disease before. That okay. piece of information has never been directly documented. But as you, you connect together these cause and effect relationships across multiple leaps, you can start to illuminate how things are connected in a way that nobody else has seen before. Um, so it, it starts to get very, very interesting and, and it really gets powerful when you're, you're trying to understand how particular drug targets influence different diseases, um, what are the potential biomarkers that are likely um, to be um, likely to come up in, in those particular experiments? You know, all of these different causal inference type analyses you can do with this data um, are very, very interesting. And mm. I think there are lots of companies out there that are building these in silico pipelines that are kind of crying out for this data. Um, so we're, we're very much focusing on um, trying to capture that data to support those drug discovery processes to enable those kinds of analyses. Yeah, I see. Okay. So it's not just helping people find information, it's, it's helping them gather insight and gain insight through those through those inferences and through those connections. Yeah, the, the insights is really, really important. Mm -hmm. You've kind of got two groups of people that we're, we're, we're looking to support. Um, you've got the, the kind of data scientists and the computational biologists who are they're the ones that, that really just want to develop the algorithms. So they yeah. want the data itself. They, they just want to play around with it. They want to figure out um, interesting hypotheses in their own right. And then you've got the, the biologists and the analysts who, who really care less about, um, you know, all, capturing all the data and structuring and that kind of thing. What they're interested in, as you say, is the insights. They've probably already got a drug target or a disease area that they're working in and a lot mm -hmm. of it understanding in that and they're looking to reinforce that with additional insights around um yeah around those those areas so if we can make that easy for people if we can build tools that improve that user experience and really give people confidence in the experiments they're about to do then then that's that's an incredibly um empowering experience that we're, we're passing on to our customers so yeah it's it's um it's, it's a major goal of what we're trying to do it's not just yeah. the data scientists it's also the biologists as well and supporting them yeah interesting it, it reminds me of um so last year we had uh, someone on the show from a company called synthase who are a laboratory automation company and they're, they're uh, automating biological laboratories primarily in different industries um and, and what we were talking about with them is you automate the the laborious, repetitive processes, but also what their robots are able to do is is some experiments that scientists just can't do because of the accuracy of it and, and things like that. I suppose this is a different part of the process, of course, but you know the the, the amount of mundane activity that must happen searching through this literature for a human to do it when a computer can do it faster and more effectively anyway, it, it, you must be saving a huge amount of time, but also then gathering spotting these patterns that computers spot that people may well miss. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the first bit is, is really the boring bit, as you yeah. say. Definitely saving saving time in capturing this this uh, this data. I mean, to give give you some numbers here, if you um if you if you just got somebody to to, to curate a document, like take a piece of published research, read through it, put all of that data into a into a database. Um, 
it's probably about two hundred dollars to get somebody to do that that particular job. And you've got in in the the kind of biomedical domain in excess of a hundred million documents out there that mm. contain relevant data, and obviously it's growing all the time. So it's just a completely um, impractical task to go out there and have have people manually curate it, and it's getting harder and harder and harder. Yeah. And then if you you put on top of that the fact that we're, we're always changing the way that we want to um, represent biology uh, and the, the data that we're going after. Mm. So that sort of curation task itself is always evolving. Yes. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that's the kind of boring side of it. But then, as you say, the interesting bit is where you, once you've got all of this data that, that really most people haven't actually seen before because they, yeah, it's, it's never been curated, it's never been structured, and it's, it's not, not in existing databases. So, so then actually finding these patterns, it starts to get, get really, really quite interesting. Um, I mean, one of the things that we've just done internally that we're, we're all really excited about in, in BioRelate right now is, is we, we can, so we can actually tell you um, what the pure unknown knowns are between any, any drug target and any disease based mm. on entire corpus of, of literature that's out there uh, and that that basically means that those two things have never been published together before um, there's no um, there's, there's no kind of direct causal relationship that's ever been documented um, so so there's really no no existing evidence that people are working on these two things at the moment but then alongside that we we have these these causal inference analyses that show how these unknown knowns are potentially connected uh, and when you get the really, really strong signals that these two things are connected and you know that nobody else is working on it, it it's incredibly exciting because mm. you've illuminated something that, that nobody's seen before or at least it is, is uh, openly working on. So yeah. Yeah, this, this data is, is yeah, it's, it's very, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it, it makes total sense. Even even to me, as not a scientist, it makes total sense what the value would be. And uh, you know, I suppose there's so much there's so much work going into generating this data in the first place, and it's just it's a shame if it doesn't get used and it doesn't get leveraged. And 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 as we say, you know, that 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 data isn't maximized. So it's it's I can see how they, this would impact a lot of research. And, and you mentioned you're looking at broadly biomedical research are there particular areas you're focused on within that yeah so what what we've tried to do with the technology that we developed is is to make something that is kind of horizontal so you could apply apply the same um same technology to extract cause and effect um really outside of biomedicine you could do it for for anything really that there is a cause and effect relationship in text mm. but where we started initially is, is a, the really early stages of drug discovery where you know truth, truth seeking behaviors are, are really quite important yeah uh, so i mean there's, there's been a lot of um i think fanfare about the success of companies like astrazeneca in the last decade where they focus far more on on truth seeking behaviors things like the um the five r's mm -hmm. but really they're trying to understand at those early phases of drug discovery are these targets actually going to be successful by the time you know we, we put these through all the the costings of, of clinical trials? Uh, and so understanding you know the mechanism of action, what the what things like potential pharmacodynamic biomarkers might be, um, you know all of the different safety and tox that type of stuff. You can if you can capture that that data and that understanding before you've actually done any experiments. Then, then you're going to save yourself a lot of cost, and, and um, you're going to be focusing on the right, the right targets to work on. So we, we've very much placed all of our efforts initially in the early stage of drug discovery. We feel mm. the, the the right positioning of our technology, but we feel as we as we grow out and we, um, we have more success working at a grander scale, then this could be applied to lots of different areas. Uh, there's yeah, all sorts of interesting things that you can do with causal inference um, if you've got the data. Mm. So, so yeah, we're we're quite excited about the potential for this, and we're thinking big. And um, seven and a half years in, you mentioned. Um, so one of the reasons I was interested in speaking to you, Dan, about about your journey with it, and we'll come back to the story of it a little bit. But um, you know, I think seven and a half years in, 
a company is a proper company, right? You've worked out what you're doing, you're moving it forward, you've got a platform that works. It's, you know, you've gone past that sort of early startup stage. Tell us a bit about where the company is today. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the journey I've kind of gone on is, is probably what a lot of entrepreneurs go on through multiple companies. I've kind mm. of done with, with BioRelate the whole time and, and uh, I've been quite lucky, I think. Um, so where I started the business, um, from from the PhD, I essentially had zero funding and uh, and and spun it out on, on my own with um, yeah like a, a rough plan <laughs> and right. uh, and yeah had to generate revenue immediately and yeah I, essentially it was a services business to start with working with smaller biotechs but also as big, companies as big as AstraZeneca in in the early days mm. so. I managed to get some traction and from there took in some VC investment around around about 2018 um, from Catapult Ventures, Maven Ventures and six angel investors or five angel investors, I think it was, sorry, it's part of the um, Manchester Tech Trust Angels. And right. that's where the company shifted towards being um, more of a products company than a services company where, you know, hired out the first staff, we, we moved all of the the, the technology and demos which we've been developing over those years into the cloud and that's where essentially the platform was born and we started to bring customers on board to our um, main products which are galactic web and galactic data and so that's that was the kind of second phase of the company mm. where we've got to now is that we have we have customers using those products they're, they're renewing and, and signing multi-year deals and all the kind of early signals of product market fit that you you like to see um, in in a company. So we're, we're kind of at the phase now where we're about to to go through the next stage of our our journey, which is the, the kind of scalability phase, where we you know we invest more money into the company and we really try to grow the commercial side of of what we've built. So it's been it's been a quite a slow start, um, but it's been a really um, I, I think because it's kind of a deep tech company. And um, the the technology we're working with, it's it's really hard to get right. And yeah, we, we've yeah we spent quite a lot of time working with customers to actually see see this working. Work, go through individual projects, come out, see the results, and then be confident that we're making the, the right decision for the next step. Um, so you know, if I did it again, I would do it much quicker. You know, through <laughs> yeah, a lot of the mistakes that I made, but. Um, yeah, I mean, we're here, so so things must have gone all right. No, that's it. That's it. I think you know, especially in that first sort of five to eight years, I think just just staying around is is the key measure of success, right? And then if you can do anything on top of that, that's that's uh, that's you know impressive, and 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 people can can be proud of that. I think. Um, interested to go back to what you mentioned about the very first part of the company. So you span it out your PhD, didn't take any funding, had to generate revenue. And I think it's obviously a little different from the the startup story that we see around a lot where people get this seed funding or they get an angel investor straight away or whatever. Now, I I personally, and this is just my opinion, I I appreciate that some companies or some types of companies, you can't do it that way around with, but I think there's real value in having to actually get out there and generate revenue and win customers and, and build something that that people want straight away and get that right. I mean, what are your sort of thoughts on what you learned from having to do it that way around or, or what what the benefits of that were for the company? Um, well, I guess the, the main thing about working with customers um, when you're developing a product and it's not fully ready yet is that the whole thing becomes a lot more agile. So mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're feeding back their requirements, their feedback, their um, you know better ways of doing things into that product development rather than sat in a dark room developing something that you think is going to solve the problem, taking a rather academic approach to it, and you know publishing publishing those results or trying to get early adopters on um, in the you know in the, the post R and D phase. We we just kind of we we had some we had some prototypes that broadly worked. We knew what we needed to do to make it um work at scale mm-hmm. uh, but it was a uh, it's just a difficult um difficult kind of trial and error process to get there um but honestly the the whole sort of starting company um 
having had no experience of running a company, doing yeah. set, building product, literally coming straight from PhD, it was, uh, it was stressful. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. I, I actually feel that if I did do it again, I probably would sit myself in an accelerator, um, take a, mm. a, find a you know a co-founder and, and, and do it like that. I mean, that, that, that last part was probably the, the biggest single mistake just doing it on my own. Right. Uh, having a, if I had a proper co-founder to work with, um, just sharing the load and the responsibilities would have made the whole process much, much quicker. Um, and um, obviously less stressful for me having somebody to, um, yeah, split the work. So, so yeah, it was, it was kind of, it was kind of difficult, um, but uh, uh, yeah, as I say, got here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and so was it just the case then that you you spotted the opportunity, wanted to start, and just went for it, and that's that's why you didn't look for a co-founder or investment, or what what was what was the sort of situation there? Um, well, I find, I mean, everybody kind of invents their own narrative after. True. <laughs> right so I, I don't know if this is accurate or not but i mean honestly if i go back to when i did start the company i think it was like a a series of of kind of confidence boosts that mm. the point where i was gonna actually go ahead and and, and spin out and, and do the thing um and I, I i guess what was was sort of driving all of it was that i wanted to i wanted to run a company i wanted to, right. to be you know, um but i I didn't actually know what it was going to be in. So I had, I had like a load of other things that I was working on at the time. Um, most of it was completely unrelated to my, my actual expertise. So I had this, uh, I was trying to build a, like a gym comparison website. Okay. Um, with, without really any understanding of like gyms. So, <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, it just seemed like a good idea because most people were trying to find gyms and yeah. yeah. It's kind of like stuff like that. I had a, um, I had a few other ideas that I was working on, and and then and then sort of as part of my, my PhD work, as I say, I, I had some really some some pretty big success with it, um, and but it was kind of like it was a project. So I, it was like how how do you how do you turn this project into a, a giant scalable company? Mm. And if you consider at the time, you know, no understanding of the the basic rules. Of, of, of how you form a company, structure it, you know, missions, vision, values, all, all the kind of basics of, of a startup, you know, not knowing that stuff, it's not intuitive when you've, you've had a, a good project and a good idea that this yeah. is actually. Um, so the, the process I went through to actually forming a company was that I, I entered a couple of startup competitions uh, and I won. I was, yeah, pretty lucky that I won. Um, but um, that, that sort of gave me a little bit more understanding. Um, and then I actually had a really good mentor um, through one of those competitions that kind of stayed with me for the first first year or two. Mm. Yeah, I won't name drop him, but um, he uh, he's now a really big VC. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been somebody that's always been there to sort of pick up the phone, particularly in those early phases. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think the biggest problem that everybody has when they're starting a company and even even when they're they're in in a company and working in it it's just the whole imposter syndrome thing it's yes. for, for phd students because you, you're in this culture right where you're you're sat sat there with everybody talking about career paths uh, um essentially being um yeah which which postdoc position are we going to go after mm -hmm. or which you know, shall I, shall I go off and do something completely unrelated to my PhD now that I've got a PhD and I've got a few letters on my name? You know, it's, 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 it's that kind of culture that, that's just highly prevalent within mm. PhD. There isn't much entrepreneurship. There, there really isn't. Like, most people that do PhDs don't start companies. Yeah. Um, very, very few people um, do actually start a company, particularly in the UK. It's mm -hmm. a bit... It's a bit Bit, uh, bit less of a problem in the states. I think there's there's more of this entrepreneurial mindset, but here in the UK, big big problem. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, it was sort of breaking out of that mold and and, uh, and and you know telling myself that yeah, be more confident, just do it, take a risk. Um, so yeah, um, it, it it was hard. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think that's something that um, 
you know, I've, I've actually seen a couple of LinkedIn posts about this this week, but it's something that I haven't seen talked about much before, before that is that so you, you look at people who run companies and from the outside, it looks like they know what they're doing, right? <laughs> it looks like they have everything, like they're, they're really confident and they have a plan and all this kind of stuff. And I'm sure some of them are, you know, a lot more, you know, they know what they're doing more than others, but um, there is that sense of, you've got to get over the precipice to start the company in the first place right and then you start it and it's you know it's quite exciting at the beginning and then you realize oh right I've done, this is what i'm doing now um and you, like you say you, you there's probably a transition of um you don't quite see yourself as a ceo at that point you, you sort of someone doing something um mm. and you know there is that that fear around it that imposter syndrome as you say and and you know you you can tell me this. So I, I'm two and a half years into mine. So you're a bit further down the line than me. But um, I, I often just am driven by the fact that the whole thing could fall apart at any moment, even after you get some traction. Does that does that ever go away? First of all, no, no. You you, you still you still have this this whole like fear around you um, constantly. Mm. But you learn to live with it, and it becomes very very normal. Um, which is not a good advertisement for running a company. <laughs> reality unfortunately yeah um, um I, I guess the thing i would say though is that um the, the thing about founding and and being a ceo for the company is that you know there can only ever be one founder of the company um or or, or founders you know mm -hmm. one you can't hire another founder once you've uh, got to a certain point and, and that's um and that's a really important thing that i think people need to realize that are running companies i'm sure they do um it's you you have just this this passion and this this um drive to make it work that nobody else is ever going to have yeah. and that and that sort of the the extra the extra fear that you have and the extra care that you have um that that you want this to work um is uh it's often what helps you solve those problems that um most people um wouldn't wouldn't see or, or bother to solve um or you know I think, I think, yeah, I think that that's what gets you through a lot of the um, particular early phases of being a CEO and a founder. Once you've, once you've kind of been doing it for a while, um, there are a lot of common skills to it. And most of it is just understanding how to be a good manager mm -hmm. and, and, you know, managing the people around you in the right way. Once you've got those, those skills too, then, then yeah, the whole, the whole running a company thing gets, gets a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but it's, but it's still a constant learning process. I mean, what you're trying to do with a company, um, particularly a startup, is you're, you're always trying to move it forward into new territory. Mm -hmm. So by default, you're always doing something brand new every day that, yeah. that you, you know, you're not, not accustomed to. So n nobody, nobody is good at that. Like no, nobody's done that mm -hmm. um, your company before. There, there is no person that can walk in and be really, really good at that. Um, so once you kind of realize that uh, and you know without being arrogant in yourself and being overconfident but also knowing that that you're probably the best person to do it then you just have to get on with it yeah yeah makes sense and so so up until the point that you started the company you'd been training as a bioinformatician is that correct uh yeah i guess that's what the, the old old word for data yeah. science I think true yeah. true um and and so no no sort of business education or anything formal around that or um had you done bits and pieces what what was your sort of level of knowledge there um no nothing no um no formal education um i did kind of sit in the business school um mm. in manchester just to like take in um yeah just the basics of, of running a company and that was actually pretty helpful um i read a a lot of books um mm. not really the kind of academic books but more like you know kind of people that have done it before so yeah. other famous kind of ceos and less kind of management consultants and more just like interesting startup um type books mm. um, and again that's really helpful because it it sort of gives you the the confidence and then just just talking to people um is is quite a big thing um yeah so talking to other founders other ceos you, you tend to find that they're they're all struggling with the same kind of problems yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and any particular, I'm sure there's a lot, but um, from a sort of point of view of, of business lessons or things that you've learned about, not so much the technology side of it, but running a business that um, that stuck in the mind or that, that were really valuable for you? Yeah. Um, I think that the most important thing when you're running a company is is really to to take care of the people that that you employ um and that that's right right from the beginning at which the point at which you you go to employ them and you know recruit them and get them into the company um so yeah i think where where things have gone wrong for me in the past it's it's probably because i've i've not paid enough care mm. in in the kind of recruitment process either um the the positions that we've we've kind of gone for been slightly they turned out differently to what we planned and it didn't align with somebody's expectations and you know we we didn't work hard enough to to understand whether they had the the right values for the company um so i really think paying paying a, a huge amount of, of attention to the people that you bring into your journey is the most important thing um in in building a successful company um, if you get that right, then the whole thing's just a lot easier. Mm. It, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, even if you're weak at business, right? <laughs> you bring in somebody that has those skills yes. um, to, to compensate for, for whatever good skills that you've got. Uh, sorry, to, yeah, um, to work in synergy, whatever skills you've got. Mm. Uh, it's, it it kind of works. So paying a lot of attention to the recruitment side is um is for me one of the biggest most important things in building a company yeah yeah and it's amazing especially when you start bringing in people with different skills when you bring in people who are sort of in the same area as you it, it's not quite the same but when you start bringing people with different skills the, the multiplying effect can be amazing if you get the right people in absolutely yeah and yeah it's um it's kind of hard to know what what people will be like when they're you know mm. combine these groups of people together but the the overriding factor i think for all of it is if, if you understand the values of the company really really well and your um you know you, your interview process is is completely geared towards eking that out making sure that they align with those values then then yeah those people probably will work together very very well even if they've they're completely different diverse backgrounds and yeah. different they'll work in synergy because they you know they value the same things so, um, so yeah, values is, is absolutely critical in, in making that work. Yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned this just before, uh, and I wanted to come back to it. So getting the right people in, of course, critical, but you, you also said, that, you know, really taking care of the people that, that come into the company. Can you talk a bit about that? Um, yeah, it's, it's essentially, you know, if you're trying to build something difficult, um, that like a startup where mm. you're you're kind of expecting people to um, yeah to work really hard um, to to essentially break ground um, take a risk come into the business um, and 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 help you um, change the world in some way uh, it sounds like a cliche but really mm. if you're not trying to do that then yeah. you're not a proper startup um, so so yeah um, you know that, that that requires a lot of commitment from people so. You have to properly take care of them, um, you know, from offering the right stock options, pay, um, you know, to making sure that they're, you know, well looked after in, in the, what they do at the company, making sure that their, you know, training and development, all that kind of stuff is, is kept in check. If you keep look after them, they'll they'll look after the company. Uh, in turn, that will look after the customers, which in turn will look after the shareholders. So it's uh, it's a really really important thing. If you look after the people in the company you're you're going to be um on the right path to success yeah i, I remember once um speaking with uh, this is years ago now as he was the ceo of quite a not a big big pharma company but a good medium-sized pharma company and he'd been done a very good job there and i was kind of trying to understand the organization and i started drawing a little org chart on a piece of paper and passed it to him and i said is this about right and he said yeah but turn it the other way around so i'm on the bottom i'm supporting these people and those people are supporting those people it's not going downwards we're supporting the people who are on the front line and i always thought that was a really novel way to think about it and and really true yeah yeah it's, it's i mean it's, it's, it's really important that 
you know, once, once you get to a certain stage of, of growth, the, the founder is, is doing like less of the actual stuff. You're just there mm. trying to get people, people around you that are doing most of the hard work. Um, so, so yeah, it's really, really important that you know your place. And I, I, you know, I quite like that notion of reverting the ore chart. That, that makes mm. a lot of sense. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to come back a little bit to the work that you guys are doing. And I suppose putting it in the broader context of, of data science, bioinformatics, AI, however you want to refer to it, in drug discovery, because there's been a huge amount of activity across this, this sort of subsector over the last few years. And I think what we're starting to see is it's not settling down a bit is the wrong word, but it, it, it's kind of, there are certain companies who are now really clear on what they do and, and what you're typically finding similar to what, what you've done is that they're focusing on a really niche area. There's less of this sort of idea that AI is the answer to every problem. Um, what, what are your views on sort of where, where this technology type of technology is in drug discovery and, and, you know, how far along we are, what, where it's with the state of the nation in, in AI and drug discovery, if you like. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem with AI is it's such a blanket term and it, yeah. it it's got a, a very broad range of different tools and applications that are encompassed within the umbrella. So it, often when people talk about AI solving drug discovery, really what they're talking about is automation. It's, it's less about, it's, it's less about the fact that this is, that there's machine learning involved. It's more about the fact that um, there, there is a, yeah, that there is an automated decision-making process somewhere along that journey. Mm. Um, usually machine learning is the best answer to that. So where you've got lots of, lots of niche companies working lots of niche areas is because those problems are, are usually pretty difficult and they require a very specific type of yeah. tooling and automation in order to solve it. I mean, um, so, I mean, I can focus on something very specific, like what we're working on, which is, um, you know, we're, we're trying to capture data stored in text. And there are lots and lots of different companies out there that are working in the tech space or natural language processing space. Mm -hmm. um, but then within that space, you, you've got lots of different subdomains, lots of different areas in which, which people are working on in order to solve um, Quite, quite broad and different problems. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, there's lots of research going into things like question and answer. There's lots of research going into text summarization. There's lots of research going into like sentiment analysis. And, and these these are all quite quite different applications often in terms of how they're used. So, yeah, the the people that are working on these solutions they they tend to start with you know what the, the kind of generic best approach is and then refine it refine it refine it for um drug discovery and you end up with something quite niche like you say mm. it doesn't really make um doesn't surprise me at all that that you've got lots of companies now working in very discrete areas um so so yeah it's, it's just i think the problem is the, the actual term itself it's so misleading yeah yeah, no, I understand. And actually, interestingly, I've seen a few companies now um, push back against their AI tag a little bit, uh, and they start talking about they've started talking about computational approaches again rather than AI, um, which is interesting. Uh, I guess it's kind of uh, some of the CTOs and, and people like that are sort of saying, "Well, yes, we do that, but this is this is a broad this is one piece of a broader uh, toolkit that we use." Yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, I think anyone that's actually in this industry, they, they take it with a pinch of salt now. Yeah. Um, I mean, AI is still a pretty sexy term, so it works pretty well in marketing. So yeah. <laughs> it's dying anytime soon. But um, yeah, I, I don't know, beyond um, yeah, AGI, like artificial general intelligence, which people are talking about now, and mm. uh, it's, uh, it's probably going to stick around for quite some time, I think. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you were thinking about I guess someone who perhaps was at the stage you were at when you were finishing up your PhD, where maybe they've got an idea or maybe just a, a sort of general desire to, to start a company and lots of ideas they're kicking around to, to find the right one. Looking back on it now, we've touched on some of the things that, that were important in you starting up and we've touched on some of the lessons you've learned along the way. Is there kind of one or two pieces of advice that you would give to someone in that situation or, or something that you wish you'd known at that point that you know now? Um, yeah, so I think 
most PhD people are going to have a lot of good ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, they're, they're probably working on an area which not many other people are working on. So they're already probably one of the world's leading experts in whatever they're doing um, alongside. They're probably more of an expert than their, their supervisor or their, their PR professor. Yeah. Is on top of them. Um, most people don't realize that. So I think the first thing is to, to just be confident in the fact that you probably know more than you think you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second thing is to actually take yourself out of that environment and surround yourself with the people that, that, that generally are the ones that are going to start companies. So th this is why I said I'd probably join an accelerator or something like that, because you put yourself in that environment, then you're, you're surrounded by other entrepreneurs, other people that have these um, business ways of thinking. And, um, and it's, it's very, very different. And you have all of this support, um, mentorship and, and that kind of thing. So either, either getting yourself into that environment or finding a group of friends, co-founders, you know, going to a meetup, meetups and that kind of thing, just really actually trying to take yourself out of that world and put yourself into the entrepreneur's world yeah. is the most important thing. Because as soon as you do that, the behaviors that are associated with being an entrepreneur and starting a company become more normal to you. Mm -hmm. And then you start to see exactly why um, your idea that you've got is a bad one or a good one, you know, depending on what it is you're working on and how you might actually turn that into a company. Not many people um, in a PhD um, are going to have the willpower to, to suddenly start researching, starting a company, um, yeah. uh, figuring out all the intricacies of, of what that involves, um, and, and successfully launch it and, and do it without any support. So just getting yourself into the environment where you can get that support is, is pretty important. Yeah. And I, I suppose going back to that point around the imposter syndrome stuff, you, you mentioned earlier something about, um, you know, as you start to speak to people who are in the same situation, you sort of realize that everyone's struggling with the same challenges. And I guess, you know, going into those environments, you'll probably see that those questions that you're facing, those things you're trying to figure out, well, all these other people are trying to figure them out as well. It's not just that you don't get it or that you can't work it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, there are so many good ideas, right? But it's mm. it's less about the idea. It's far more about the execution. Mm -hmm. if, if you if you like work with the people that, that help you understand how to execute that idea properly, you know, tell the right narrative, um, you know, get that funding journey sorted, get the, you know, just get the whole fundamentals of running a business in check, then it's going to be far more successful. Even if it's an average idea, it's yeah. probably going to be far more successful than, than a really good idea and, and none of that support. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose, you know, one of the things that, that you've, you've shown with your company is that, you know, this idea that you don't need to go and get an MBA, you don't need to know everything about business to start a company, you don't need to, but you've got to have that appetite to learn and that that motivation to learn and uh, and push yourself to learn the things you need to learn. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a lot of fanfare about um, you know that founders and CEOs that don't have MBAs at the moment because they're more product focused. I mean, my on honest answer is I. You know, I don't want know what it's like to have an MBA. Sure. But, so, uh, yeah, I have no idea. But it's, uh, I think it's certainly becoming a bit trendier to not have an MBA and and, and be the person on the. Um, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's there's strengths either way. Mm, mm -mm, absolutely. Um, so we talked a bit about where the company is at currently at the beginning. Um, tell us a bit about the future and and what's next for you and BioRelate. Um. Yeah, well, so I guess for me, it just kind of feels like we're about to move into the next next part of the journey, as I said mm -hmm. in this conversation. So really scaling the company is going to be quite a long process, I think. Um, one that's going to be, um, yeah, it's going to take me quite a few years. So I haven't really thought about anything other than than just making BioRelate really successful. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got a plan, it's working, so I'm very much going to stick to executing that. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm still pretty young, so I don't know what I'll do after after BioRelate, but um, yeah, I hope I'm still still involved in, in, in what we're doing, at least for the next five, ten years, because, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of big goals here, and um, 
And I think there's there's a lot to be done, a lot of low-hanging fruit um, that we're well positioned to solve. So, yeah, I'm excited for that. No, absolutely. Well, we wish you the best of luck with it, Dan. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's been a very nice chat. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for joining us on Careers in Discovery. And don't forget to subscribe for more insight into the world of drug discovery and R&D. Do take a look at our sponsors, Singular Talent, and their mission to make hiring better for companies and individuals in drug discovery and R&D. You can find them at www.singulartalent.io. See you next time.